Hi folks, my name is Maureen Callahan. I'm a member of the Yale Archive Space Implementation Committee, and I want to talk you through Container Management, which is a plugin built by Hudson Longolo and sponsored by Yale, and adds what I think are some pretty exciting features to Archive Space. So I'm going to start with this introduction. I'll be doing a series of videos, so stay tuned. So, uh, the most exciting thing here is the ability to do searches on containers, to declare facts about them, and then to act on them in bulk. So the way you do that is you look at plugins that are scoped to repository. Uh, so here under plugins, go to manage top containers. And then you're presented with this screen. Uh, this is really sort of an advanced search screen. It lets you pick the top containers you want to see by a number of different criteria. Uh, so keyword is really straightforward if you're looking for all the containers in a resource or an accession, you can do it that way. There's also this concept of container profile, which I'll talk about in a different video. And you can also search by location, which is really useful for activities like shelf reads. So uh, let's search by resource. In this case, I want to find all my containers in the William F. Buckley papers, and I'll do a search. Here I see that there are 939 distinct containers in the William F. Buckley papers. And in this results screen, you see that there are a few different facts about it. Uh, keep in mind this is sort of pre-migration data that we're working with, so there are going to be some things that are kind of funny. It has nothing to do with the plugin, it has more to do with the data work that we're doing at Manuscripts and Archives. So, um, when I look at the screen, I see that I can see my containers in terms of which resource or accession they're from. Um, I also get an indication of which series it belongs to. I know it's common in some repositories to restart box numbering at each series, so this seems like it would be a useful thing. There's this container profile. What this tells me is information about the box itself. So in this context, I have a page 15 box. That's the name of it. And I also have information about its depth, its height, and its width, and how extent is measured. Um, by assigning this information to the container itself, there's really interesting work that we can do with reporting or calculating extents. If you're moving, it could be useful to know, you know how many shelves you need, how many book trucks, how many moving vans, etc. Uh, then moving on to the next column, we get the indicator, uh, box number. Uh, we also get the barcode, the current location, and then we have information about it, the relationship of these containers to the ILS. When we were doing this work, uh, we were looking at sort of our end-to-end -end workflow about how materials are described, how they're managed, and then how they come out to the patron. And at Yale, uh, I, we do something which is, I think, really common, that we store information archivally in a system like Archivist Toolkit or Archive Space, but we also have a bib record for each collection in Voyager, our ILS. We have a holdings record, and for each container, there's an item record. And as we were working on this top container work, we realized, well, a container is really the same thing as an item record. So maybe there are things that we can build into the Archive Space database so that there are ways that uh, data about Voyager can be stored in Archive Space and possibly in the future information about Archive Space can be stored in Voyager. So what this is telling you is that uh, the holding ID in our ILS for this is this number um, and that this had been exported to, IL to the ILS. Um, there's probably also an ILS item ID. As we moved forward, we realized that uh, duplication across these systems of this information actually isn't necessary. So instead of taking all this container information and putting an item record into our ILS, maybe instead what we should be doing is getting all the peripheral systems that had been talking to Voyager to just talk to archive space instead. And so moving forward at Yale, uh, Aeon will talk to Archive Space. Our offsite storage database will talk to Archive Space. So the process of moving materials out to offsite storage and having that database communicate to Archive Space will happen pretty automatically. The process of someone requesting materials and needing to know where it's shelved and getting a call slip sent to the appropriate place, that's also managed through Archive Space. But if you're an institution that uses your ILS as sort of the go-between to manage all of that, business logic, uh, this container 
management plugin creates spaces in the database for you to hold that. Okay, so now that I've done my search, uh, let's say that I want to do some operations on the containers that I've selected. So uh, an example of this might be I have done all of my resource description and I want to do barcoding. Let's say that you don't already see barcodes here. So what I would do is um, something that I might want to do is uh, select everything that I have. And this has to select 939, so it might take a second. And then what I'll end up doing is I'll go up here to this bulk operations. And there are a few things I can do. Um, it, since it's all in the same resource, I might say, all right, let's assign the same holding ID to all of these. Or you know, if they vary, you can do it that way. Um, I might want to update my container profile. So here I see which boxes are flat boxes and which are page and whatever. Maybe I did a big rehousing project and everything is now in page 15 boxes. And I want to update that. Um, maybe everything except for this one is in a page 15 box. And so I want to do a bulk operation on just the set I've selected. Um, I can also update locations in bulk. Um, this is really useful for moves or just moving things around. If I have a current location of my processing space and I want to send it off-site, I can do that. So let's, let's look at what update locations look like. I'm just going to click that. What this does is it gives me a report of all of the containers that I've selected. Um, it's just a good thing to look through and verify. And then I'm going to pick my location. Um, and I can, I can use the type ahead for that. Um, I might say, all right, these are all going into the B69 um, in this spot. That's probably not the case. Or if I don't want to use the type ahead because I'm not exactly sure what I have, I can go to this browse option. And this pulls up my locations. And I can start filtering this text. All right. Uh, so let's say I want to set it to send it all to LSF and to locations. And then I update these 938 records. And again, I'm looking at a lot of records, so this may take a moment. I'm going to click continue. Other things that I can do with these bulk operations up here. Rapid barcode entry. Let's talk a little bit about barcodes. So something that I think is pretty exciting with this is uh, top we can set validation around what barcodes do. Um, so an example of that would be we can set in our repository that all barcodes across the whole system should be 14 digits. Or we have a situation at Yale where barcodes for most repositories are 14 digits, but for the Yale Center of British Art Institutional Archives, they're nine digits. So uh, that is a parameter that can be set for every repository 14, except for YCBA, IA, make it nine. And what this means is uh, you're just going to have fewer errors with data entry. Um, I mean, even the wand is, they say it's more than 99% effective, but there's that less than 1% where the barcode gets off by a little bit, and it's, it's good for the system to remind you, nope, this isn't the correct length. Uh, the other bit of validation that's in here is you can't have two top containers with the same barcode. Barcodes have to be unique in the system. So that's just kind of another area where it's uh, going to prevent hassle in the future. As I was doing uh, some data validation work in Archivist Toolkit as we were trying to move over to ArchivesSpace, I found a, you know, not too many considering the scale of what we had, but a lot of problems like that of uh, the barcode being assigned to two different containers or that sort of thing. So um, these problems won't exist anymore. So I would just update these 938 records and be on my way. So I hope that this gave you a good introduction to what this does. Um, a couple of just sort of other fun things to keep in mind. Uh, something, uh, the way that the search works here is the same as any other sort of solar search command. Solar is the search engine behind this. Um, so if I, want to, if I want to find all of something except none of something else, I can use the minus sign. And so a good example of that is um, in container profiles. I, I was working with uh, someone in my repository, and we wanted to get all of these dimensions for container profiles. And so we wanted to find the flat box that was um, housed on site, not housed at LSF. So a way that I would do that 
is I would look for a flat box, maybe this one. Um, and then keyword, I would do minus OSF. And minus just means don't bring back any results that include that string. Um, let's do one that I think will be a little bit safer. Let's say R5. Okay, letter. Uh, click search. And this, what we'll see here is that this is only bringing back to me these archive letter boxes that are not shelved off site. So, you know, there are all sorts of examples of this sort of thing that you know, for instance, that uh, some boxes in a collection were sent out and some are here or some are on one shelf and some are on the other. So it's useful to be able to do some of these more complicated type searches. Um, so I think that's it for this introduction to selecting and search and updating top containers in bulk. Watch out for some more videos and um, I hope that you're as excited about this as